portability. I think that's something we should all have in mind when building modern applications. Prioritizing stateless compute, packaging things as container images that can run anywhere. You give yourself options when you think about portability. Whether that's if you're building with serverless functions and you're thinking about maybe one day you might need to move, or the opposite. Maybe you start off with a nice simple container image, and at some point in the future you need to move that business logic somewhere else. Portability is important. You give yourself options. Now, I'd never suggest you start running the exact same application across multiple different services or multiple different cloud providers, but it's nice to know that you could. And in the last video in this series, you learned the simplest way to run containers on Azure using Azure Container Apps. Hi, I'm James Easton. And to prove the point of portability, in this video, you're going to take the exact same container image, the monolithic implementation of plant-based pizza, and run that on AWS using the simplest way to run containers on AWS. Now, which cloud provider gives the simplest option? Which cloud provider is the better option? I'll leave that for you to decide. Let's get into it. Amazon ECS is a container orchestrator. It's custom built by AWS. It doesn't rely on Kubernetes or any third party tooling. It has been built from the ground up. Now, one of the big differences with ECS as opposed to running Kubernetes on AWS is that you don't pay for the cluster itself. With ECS, you only pay for the applications that are actually running inside the cluster as opposed to having that baseline cost of running the cluster itself. And then Fargate, Fargate is a compute provider. When you're deploying applications on AWS, you have two primary options to provide compute to them applications. One is to use raw EC2 instances to use virtual machines, and the other is to use Fargate. If you were to do a like-for-like -like comparison of EC2 versus Fargate, you were to take the exact same CPU and memory and try and align them as best as you could, Fargate will almost always work out more expensive than EC2 instances. That is more expensive at a line item cost, the value that appears on your invoice from AWS. What, what that does take into account is the human cost. If you choose to use EC2 instead of Fargate, you then need to operate and manage and run them EC2 instances. Fargate, you shift all of that responsibility onto AWS. So if you want to run applications without thinking a tiny little bit about infrastructure, Fargate is a really good way to do that. But how does all of this actually work? How would you actually define an application running on ECS Fargate? Well, when you deploy something to ECS, the first thing you're going to do is define your ECS cluster. Once you've got an ECS cluster, you can then deploy services inside that cluster. So inside a cluster, you will have a set of different services. Separately to that, inside ECS, you also define what is called a task definition. Think of a task definition as the actual recipe, the actual blueprint for what your application should actually do. What container image you're using, what sidecars you might have, what CPU and memory requirements you have, should you use ARM, should you use x86? All of that is defined in your task definition. And then when you deploy a service to an ECS cluster, you simply tell the service which task definition to use. ECS is then going to take that task definition, set up and run your application. Now, one thing to be aware of with ECS, especially when compared to something like Azure Container Apps, is that you need to care about some other things when you're using ECS. For example, when you define an ECS cluster and a service, you'll need to define some networking resources for that to deploy into. You'll need, you'll need NAT gateways, you'll need internet gateways. This all of these resources need networking infrastructure to be deployed into. So you will need to create VPCs, you'll need to create subnets, you'll need to create root tables, you'll need to do all of that. The other thing you'll need to do if you are deploying web applications to ECS and Fargate, you will also need to define an application load balancer. ECS doesn't natively give you URLs, it doesn't natively give you ingress, it just gives you the ability to orchestrate containers. So you'll also need to define an application load balancer, you'll need to define target groups, you'll need to set up routing tools to route things from your load balancer to the right application. There is genuinely more to think about 
if you are using ECS and Fargate, as opposed to using some of the other services that other cloud providers have, like Azure Container Apps. The trade-off there is that you get more control. You can get super granular with your routing rules. You can have one application load balancer that routes to all of your different backend applications. If you were doing that on Azure Container Apps, you'd need to manually run something like NGINX, or you'd need to configure them routing rules yourself. So all these things are trade-offs, right? For what we're doing today, you want to deploy your application in as simple as way as possible. So that gives you ECS and Fargate itself. But how do you actually get an application running inside ECS Fargate? You've already got your container image. You've, and like I said in the last video, I always like using an infrastructure as code tool that I can use in the same language that I've actually written my application code. And it gives you a consistent experience all the way down your stack. Now for Azure, we use Pulumi to do that. But AWS, AWS have their own infrastructure as code tool called the AWS Cloud Development Kit or the CDK. And the CDK is a fantastic choice when you're building simple web applications on ECS Fargate because they have some handy pre-built constructs for defining web applications and networks. So if you open up the code base linked in the description below, there is an AWS infrastructure project. And if you open up that AWS infrastructure project, you can see the CDK definition of this application. So you're going to create a new VPC. As I said, this CDK provides a helpful set of constructs, these higher level abstractions that allow you to really quickly create cloud resources. So creating this new instance of a VPC will give you the VPC, it will give you the subnets, it will give you the root tables, it will give you the NAT gateways, you can configure how many AZs you want to use. All of that stuff is packaged inside this single VPC construct. So although you do need to care about networking infrastructure, if you're choosing to use ECS and Fargate, using the CDK does does simplify some of that because you've got these higher level constructs. You've then got this cluster data type. If you remember when I was talking about how ECS and Fargate work, the first thing you define is a cluster. This is the container orchestrator that's going to orchestrate those services that are running inside it. And when you define a cluster, you need to give the cluster a name, and you also need to define a VPC that that cluster is going to be deployed into, which you've defined just higher up in this same code file. And then you've got this application load balanced Fargate service. Quite the mouthful, but this is a higher level construct again that's packaging up all the things you need to deploy a web application to ECS and Fargate. It's going to create the application load balancer, it's going to create the target groups, it's going to create that task definition that I talked about, and then finally it's going to create the actual service inside the ECS cluster, and it's going to link all of them things together. So if you hit the application load balancer, it gets routed correctly to the right Fargate service. And as you might expect defining a way to run containers on any compute infrastructure, you've got a set of properties that are pretty consistent however you're deploying containers. You define the cluster you want to deploy into, how many instances of your application you want to deploy. You could set that to 10 and you would have 10 running instances of your service. How you want this to run, this application is going to use x86 and it's going to use Linux. And then you've got the actual definition of the application itself. The image is going to come from a container registry. Here, this is using public. This is using a set of public images I've deployed to Docker Hub. So you're going to deploy your monolithic instance of plant-based pizza. You're going to set some environment variables, the database connection being the most important one. And then you can set the port on the container that you want traffic to be routed to. Again, we're going to route this to port 8080, and this will all be configured when the application load balancer is created, the target groups are created, and finally, you're going to set public load balancer to true. You want this to be a publicly addressable application. If you were to set that to be false, you would still get the load balancer. It would just only be available inside the VPC. So this is a really handy way to create web applications. You can then also define health checks. I want to set the health check to be on the root of the web application, and I'm, a, I'm, and I'm going to treat any HTTP codes between 200 and 404 as healthy. And then again, finally, we're adding the Datadog agent. That gives us observability. This is going to run the Datadog agent as a sidecar alongside the actual application itself. That will then allow us to send any telemetry, send the observability information off to Datadog for us to actually diagnose if this application goes wrong. Once you've got all of that defined. So here, again, you've got about 100 lines of C sharp. If you were doing a really direct comparison for how many lines of code does it take to define a web application, 
these two are pretty compatible. You've got about 100 lines of code, whether you're using Visual Container Apps, whether you're using AWS. Once you've got all of that defined, if you come back to your terminal, go navigate into the AWS folder in the root of the repository, make sure you've set the DD API key and database connection environment variables inside your terminal, and then you can simply run CDK deploy. That's then gonna go off and synthesize that C sharp code you've written into a cloud formation template, and then it's gonna go off and actually deploy all of them resources using cloud formation. If you start off that deploy and then navigate over to the AWS console and go into the cloud formation console, you'll see that the stack is in progress being deployed. Now, this will take a few minutes to deploy because you've got all the networking resources created, the cluster, the task definition, the service, the load balancer. There's a lot of stuff to be created. I'm going to pause the video here and I'll be back in just a moment. Once that has finished deploying, the CDK is going to give you back the ARN of the load balancer and the actual endpoint of the load balancer. If we open that up and navigate to the slash health endpoint again, you're going to get the health check status. And in this case, the health check has failed. The loyalty point service is inactive. That's okay. You've only deployed the monolith. You've not actually deployed the entire application, including the loyalty point service as well. What's actually been deployed when you've done that? Because that's going to create quite a lot of resources just using them 100 lines of C sharp. Looking in the AWS console now, you can look at the actual resources that get created. Inside the network, there's four subnets that have been created, one public subnet, one private subnet, an internet gateway, a NAT gateway, a VPC gateway. There's a, there's a bunch of different things from a networking perspective that have been created. There's also the cluster itself, as you might expect. There's a cluster now inside ECS, and that ECS cluster has one running service, which is your monolithic application. Then there's the actual application definition itself. The actual application load balancer itself, the target groups, the routing rules, all of that has been created the task definition. Remember, the task definition is like the recipe or the blueprint for your actual application and how you want it to run. And then finally, you've got the service itself, the service inside your ECS cluster, which tells ECS which task definition you should use to define and set up this service. So quite a lot of AWS resources get created just from them 100 lines of infrastructure as code. And that is all there is to it. Whilst there's a lot of resources that get created when you do that, from an infrastructure as core perspective, things are simple. You're creating a VPC, you're creating a cluster, and you're creating a load balanced web service. The rest is handled by the CDK, the CDK constructs, the abstractions, and of course, the actual resources themselves inside AWS. So, simple application packaged as a container. And container images are a fantastic way to keep your application flexible. And while you should almost never run the same application across multiple different cloud providers, the decisions you make when you architect and package your application can make a difference in the future. Prioritize stateless compute, keep your application code simple, and then deploy it in a way that keeps your infrastructure as simple as possible as well. See you in the next video.